we'll look at, at a few more of the illusionistic, uh, more realistic works by Barnes. Uh, <coughs> this is Pietà, or Revolution by Night, 1923. Even the title is kind of interesting, because the title is two different, completely different things, Pietà or Revolution by Night. They're not really... Uh, it's not like two ways of saying the same thing or something like that. It's saying two completely different things. So even the title has a sort of collage principle to it almost. Pieta is the, a well-known iconography in Christian art of um, the Virgin Mary cradling the dead Christ. So it's a mother and a son. Although here it's a father and a son, so there's a transposition. Uh, maybe we're back to the same territory as Oedipus Rex, you know, the Oedipus complex, fathers and sons and their complex relationship. Uh, and it's working out his own feelings about his relationship with his father. <coughs> Supposedly this rather strict character. The sun figure is almost like a statue frozen. Yeah, again, there's something maybe from De Chirico, De Chirico statues. Even if De Chirico never painted a painting anything like this. There's some little details you can relate in the painting to the to Di Chirico's paintings, you know, uh, but I, I won't go into that. I don't have the, s the images to really pin it down, but um, yeah, if you just <coughs> take my word for it that there are these art historical links. So if this is autobiographical, it's a kind of identification with the Christ child on Ernst's part. And one of the autobiographical stories he tells, he says, as a child, uh, he'd run away from home many times. And on one occasion, he met some pilgrims who nicknamed him the Christ child. And then when he got back home, his father painted him, as, it, as it used him as the model for a painting of the Christ child. That's, anyway, Ernst's story. He was brought up as a strict Catholic, but rejected that in adult life. So, uh, yeah, maybe he's working through his own feelings about uh, religious upbringing as well. So 1924 is the first Cerritos Manifesto, and Ernst uh, is in contact with, uh, with them and um, you know, we see a kind of tr transformation of his style around that time. Well, I'll just rush through a few other more realistic images. Two children threatened by a nightingale, 1924. Well, it's a little bit interesting, different, because it's got things attached to the surface of the painting. Uh, I, I won't talk about that. Of this men shall know nothing, 1923. Mixture of sort of anatomical details and astronomical t details. It's look almost like a map of the planet, planets' movements, planets or a, a moon, cycles of the moon, but then anatomical. Well, four legs. Well, maybe it's an image of, of, of sexuality, of human coupling, sexual coupling. Uh, there's a hand in front of the one of these astronomical signs. Uh, that's a bit like the, the, the gesture of modesty of figures like Venus. And Venus, of course, is the name of a planet. So all these sort of associations could co come in. Goddesses and planets can be confused. 
Diana was the moon goddess. A, a covering of a of a by the hand of a planet. What when do when do astronomical bodies get covered? Oh, that's an eclipse, isn't it? So you know maybe this is like a diagram of a, an eclipse. The light, uh, you know, we see the light on one side, but everything else is dark. You know, it's all—it's almost like this sort of diagramming of those uh, special moments of um, the, the the sky. At the first clear well word. Well. Uh, You know, this comes from a, a scientific article. You like to read it, all these sort of scientific publications. It's a scientific article that had a, an image like this in it of the hand uh, to illustrate an article about sense perception, touch. Apparently, if you if you hold a ball between hands that are fingers that are crossed and you touch it on the, both sides. It can feel as if there are two balls, not one ball. You know, it's how you how it's something about scientific analysis of. Um, try it later. You know, <laughs> it, it's how scientific analysis of, of sensory perceptions, something like that. But he he's taken it and played with it. He changed it slightly so these fingers start to look a little bit more like legs, and maybe it's. M more like a naked female torso or something like that as well as a hand so he's played around and of course put other things like an insect these strange sort of artichoke like things so we're taking scientific rationality and then turn it into something which is its other unconscious, unconscious and imagination and it's just one more of these um, illusionistic works before talking about how his work transformed in the face of um, surrealism. The infant Jesus being spanked by the Virgin Mary in the presence of three witnesses. Well this is, this is a, a very straightforward kind of iconoclastic kind of work attacking religion. The I mean often you get this, you get this with uh, Bunuel in his surrealist movies for instance, you know, attack of Catholicism, because Catholicism is the dominant religion in the countries from which most of the Cerritos came from. So it's, it's taking a Madonna and child image, a little bit like uh, you know the same subject matter that he was dealing with here, uh, but then you know breaking the the rules. And there are some sort of Cerritos portraits in the background as witness to the event. The halo was fallen on the ground. That, of course, is the kind of... Uh, so, <coughs> because it's such a, a famous image in art history, it's not just iconoclastic of Catholicism, it's like iconoclastic of art, you know, in the same way. But this is the kind of work he's producing uh, after the encounter with Surrealism, a little bit more um, uh, a kind of free-flowing and breaking away from... Uh, from illusionism, using more automatic processes, which the Surrealists were em emphasizing. They used this word automatism to describe their attempts to produce free-flowing fantasy in their literature. This is the, one of the techniques he's using for a visual equivalent to that, uh, which has become known as frottage, basically meaning rubbing. He's rubbing through paper the textures of various objects and putting different objects together and making uh, a new object from them. I, you could say it's still that collage principle that interested him so much before bringing things together, except it's not directly cutting up bits of images and putting them together or even painting the equivalent of those cut-up images, but um, just getting the trace of different objects. 
So I think it's pretty clear what the original objects were, like some grained wood, you know. Or, well, in this case it's clear. Maybe leaves and things like that. Organic things, but also man-made things, <coughs> putting, putting them all together to create this the strange horn creature. We've seen horn creatures already in his art. Well, there's a famous Picasso sculpture of a bull's head, yeah. another horned creature, bull's head made of a bicycle, handlebars and seat. But that, that's a little bit more simple. I mean, that's the collage principle in its essence, but it's a bit more s simple in that we, see, we have to see the bicycle and we have to see the bull to get the Picasso. But it's very fixed. It's A and B. It's one and the other. But for Ernst, we have to see what, where it came from, or partially at least. Uh, but the new thing is not something so clearly defined. It's more open-ended where, where it ends up is not such a clear-cut image A, image B. It's not quite like that. So lovely weather, lovely weather, 1925. The title starts to become a further complication of the image. They don't sort of clarify anything. He talks about this as a, sort of, as a sort of invention, this frottage technique. Um, I was struck by the obsession uh, imposed upon my excited gaze by the wooden floor, the grain of which had been deepened and, and exposed by countless scrubbings. I decided to explore the hidden symbolism of this obsession and to aid my meditative and hallucinatory powers I derive from the floorboards a series of drawings by dropping pieces of paper on them at random. There's kind of the chance effects of, that Dada likes. Uh, and then rubbing them with black lead. The drawings thus obtained steadily lost the character of the wood thanks to a series of suggestions and transmutations that occurred to me spontaneously as in visions and assumed uh, you know, the visions that come with sleep and assume the aspect of unbelievably clear images probably revealing the original cause of my obsession so then he goes on and tries out other types of um, materials uh, di with different properties so it's almost, almost a kind of uh, hallucinatory method a way of provoking hallucinations frottage is nothing other than a technical means for intensifying the hallucinatory faculties of the spirit in such a way that visions automatically appear, a means of ridding oneself of one's blindness. It's a way of find, finding, allowing new things to come up for your unconscious, find a way to break with your habits of thinking and vision. Uh, and I suppose it's something that he would like that, that um, this is something that we've all played around with as children. You know, it doesn't involve any sort of virtuosity of technical excellence as an artist. You know, that, that makes it kind of accessible to everyone. At one point, Ernst says, you know, virtuosity is for idiots, you know, to be obsessed with technical excellence. He'd used rubbings earlier on, as early as 1919. first things he rubbed you could see very clearly what the he retained the original properties of what he uh, was rubbing but whereas now he transforms these things well I'll just show you some few more examples to forget everything this is from the natural history series of 1925 conjugal diamonds from the same series. Birds are something he comes back to a lot as an obsessive image. And then 
there are painterly equivalents to those sort of frottage techniques. This is the Horde of 1927. He's put various objects underneath the surface and then sort of captured their... Uh, well, it, there are different techniques. One technique is that he puts different layers of paint on a surface, one on top of the other, then puts uh, textured objects underneath <coughs> the canvas, which is not yet stretched on a frame, and scrapes the paint away, revealing irregularly different layers. I think, again, it's a sort of technique we probably all have played with it as children. You know, you put different layers of color uh, with wax crayons, and then you scrape through. That's a slightly different technique, but the same principle. Or another thing he, he would do is to uh, put um, get <coughs> string and dip it into uh, paint and throw it randomly on a surface and see what forms are suggested. Another thing he would do is to put paint irregularly onto a piece of glass, say, and then transfer, press the unframed canvas onto the grass and ir irregularly transfer the paint onto <coughs> the canvas. It's a bit like a kind of monotype printmaking process. But there's a sort of, uh, there are two stages. There's first the, the random chance effects uh, and then there's trying to find imagery in that and specify it further so then the background uh, is something that's painted later to background it edits out the bits you don't want he sees a figure so he then he specifies the figure further by getting rid of the background <coughs> and what often emerges is as in this work is figures that is this as if they they haven't quite separated themselves out one from another there are several kind of monstrous sort of figures here but they they, they aren't quite a hundred percent separate one from the other uh, their, their bodies seem sort of conjoined in some way is as if they're sort of emerging into to being that sense of something sort of the unconscious is still we're li our unconscious is given a little bit of work to do as well we're p we're allowed to be to be part of the process of trying to make meaning here it isn't that he's gone 100 percent of the way of specifying what everything means he's leaving us part of that task as well so our unconscious is activated in the process not just his when he was making it but ours when we were we are viewing it So he's abandoned the illusionism in these works, and there's much more of a sense of a two-dimensional design than there is flattening out of space. So it's a little bit closer to modernist methods in this later phases of his life. Now I've been talking about these uh, as sort of his works uh, as sort of psychological works and maybe even related <coughs> to his own personal biographical history about his father being very strict and all that but I think we can also read it in in a more social frame and say well what was the history of Europe at that time 1927 we're talking about the interwar period uh, and you know the rise of certain threats I think it's easier to do with this work, The Angel of Hearth and Home, 1937, because this already belongs to the period after the rise of the Nazis and the period of the, uh, the Spanish Civil War, which was a sort of precursor of the Second World War, the first skirmish of that conflict with fascism. Uh, and in this case of this 1937 work, he is explicit in saying that it has some kind of relationship to uh, the, the, the Spanish Civil War. He says, one picture that I painted after the defeat of the Republicans in Spain uh, is the Angel of Hearth and Home. This is, of course, an ironic title for a kind of juggernaut which crushes and destroys all that comes in its path. That was my impression at the time of 
what would happen in the world. So it's almost like a sort of prophecy of what's coming, a feeling that the Second World War is about, about to start. Um, again, you know, it, it, it's much more pushed towards realistic detail than the horde image we were looking at. But you still have the same thing of the different creatures are not quite specified out one from the other. They're, they're kind of joined together. But here he's taken the, the process of specifying further. There's less work for us to do as spectators compared to the Horde painting. But just to, to say, you know, the whole thing, it can be related to uh, events of the, of the time, so the, the social or political context. Uh, and there are various um, themes which come back in his work. Just look at one, and that is the theme of the forest. This is uh, one of the works that shows it, the embalmed forest, 1933. Here, yeah, the forms of the trees are made by layering paint on the surface and then putting objects beneath and then scraping it away. It's, it's, uh, sometimes called grattage as opposed to frottage. You've got to use a slightly different technique if you're using paint than if you're using drawing, but it's similar to the, those earlier works. So this created this strange uh, enchanted forest feel and then put a bird in it. Birds reappear a lot in his imagery and then there's a kind of strange sort of moon, moon form forest is like a kind of wall break uh, you know that, that we can't penetrate uh, this format uh, it's not a forest but it this format is already there in one of his early collages so the college is often a place where the ideas come that paintings later make use of so this is a collage called The Little Tear Gland that says Tick Tock, 1920. And it, it's, it's got mechanical imagery. It's not a moon. It's, a, it's a, like a cogwheel from some disassembled clock or something. And these are, you know, not trees. It's some repetitive design from wallpaper or something collaged in. But it's still got this sense of a barrier that we can't penetrate and something circular behind <coughs> so that uh, even if it's not exactly the same imagery it's the same format isn't it so the, the um, forest let's try to think about what the forest might mean um, of course it you know in his autobiography he gives us some hints he says he write, he's writing about himself in, as if he's another person, in the third person. He says, mix feelings when he first went into a forest, delight and oppression, and what the romantics called emotion in the face of nature, the wonderful joy of breathing freely in an open space, yet at the same time distress at being hemmed in on all sides by hostile trees, inside and outside, free and captive, at one and the same time. I think apparently there were um, forests sort of near where he was born. I think that uh, just in a very simple way, I think the forest is like the unconscious or something like that. It's a kind of dark, mysterious place. There's some enchanting things, but also some dangerous things in there. Here's an example of him using surrealist writing, just to give you an idea of surrealist writing, actually. Uh, but it ha happens to be about a forest. He says, so who will, who will be the death of the forest? The day will come on which the for forest, hitherto a womanizer, resolves to frequent only teetotal places of refreshment, walk only on tarred roads, and concert only with Sunday afternoon strollers. He will live on pickled newspapers, Enfeebled by virtue, he will forget the bad habits of his youth. He will become geometrical, conscientious, dutiful, grammatical, judicial, 
pastoral, clerical, constructivistic and republican. He will become a schoolmaster. Will it turn out fine? Of course it will. So it's, a, it's a, like a, a little story about something wild being tamed by bourgeois respectable attitudes. Of course, something like the florist does have a history. I'm sorry, it's only a black and white slide, but um, painting by Friedrich, the great German romantic painter, the hunter in the forest, 1813 to 14. Um, you, you get the same sense of the forest as slightly kind of threatening and um, dwarfing the human figure. The human figure, in fact, is a, a French soldier, sort of like isolated from his fellows and sort of lost in the great German woods, you could say. So there's some, uh, in Friedrich's case, there's actually some sort of nationalistic meanings at play, political meanings, contemporary meanings. But more generally, you already have the idea of the forest as this sort of slightly dangerous and powerful force a warlike quality which is there in the back stands. <coughs> so nothing comes from, from nothing. There are visual sources and symbols already have meanings, but he's giving it a, a new inflection. And I just follow the, the whole thing through to a slightly later period. This is um, uh, you know, what an American abstract artist does, I think influenced by Max Stans, one of the American <coughs> abstract expressionists who picks up the idea of, uh, of surrealist ideas of Max Ernst. The Frozen Sounds, number one, of 1951 by Gottlieb. And I think it's hard to imagine a work like this without that kind of wall of the forest by uh, Max Ernst with a, a, a sun or moon uh, up above it, which is there in several of his works. So that's a sort of influence, I think, to Gottlieb. And then Gottlieb takes it further towards abstraction the work like this well the, the forest now has just become this sort of calligraphic energetic mass and a circle of the sun uh, above it and then to bring it all back home to Hong Kong Hong Kong artist Lu uh influenced by by Gottlieb but probably not even realizing that somewhere behind this is Max Ernst you know so there's a strange little kind of root that has brought us here, and you could even go further. You could say the Hong Kong Art Development Council's logo is uh, has a sort of black splurgy thing and a red dotty thing. You know, uh, I can't remember who designed it. Uh, maybe someone who's a pupil of a pupil of Louis Chauvin or something like that. Well, we're running out of time. But just if you, if you don't mind, if you have to go, please go. But just to I want to finish looking at Max Ernst, just show you a few. Uh, it's again the collage principle. He produced a whole series of works called Un Semaine de Bonté, 1934, a week of kindness, you could say. Um, collage is again from printed illustrations and then joined a little bit by ink, you know, to, to, to make them seem homogenous. So it's a, a sort of a tack on bourgeois society, taking the sort of melodramatic literature and the illustrations from it, uh, or he's taking the scientific literature that explains away the world and gets rid of all its mystery, um, the, the consumerist literature, all the products in catalogues for sale, and he's using it to sort of work against that society itself. So producing very sort of dreamlike I images, bizarre juxtaposition. And there's a sense of a story, but it, 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 you know, it never quite comes together into a narrative. But it, it's presented in a book-like format, so you have that kind of sense of narrative development and sequencing of <coughs> images, very careful sequencing. <coughs> Thank you.
images within images. You know, again, that's like the Kiriko. It's a way of introducing another world within one world. Well, it could be something uh, scientific or, you know. He's using, yeah, all so sorts of different kinds of, uh, of sources. So it's uh, starting with reality or the images we are given of reality, but then subverting. So humor, as with uh, Dada, humor is always a big strategy. Big tool. Well, we've seen birds before in his work. And then just to, to finish, Europe after the rain, 1940 to 42. Uh, the Europe after the rain, number two, actually. This is produced by um, pressing onto the irregular surface of the canvas a smooth surface object, say glass, covered with uh, uh, uneven patterns of, of, of wet paint. And then specifying further the images that suggest themselves to him, especially cutting out the background, painting the background as, uh, on top of the foreground. And there's this strange sort of mixture in this wartime work of animal, vegetable, mineral, you know, things animate and inanimate are all merged to, to one. It, it, again, it's a work one wants to read on to the particular social political situation of the time of war. It even looks, it even seems almost prophetic looking ahead to a sort of post-nuclear holocaust nightmare in a way. It's a, 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 at the m moment this work was painted, the nuclear weapons had not yet been invented. But one has that sense of extreme <coughs> devastation and mutation and so forth. So in interpretation, we have to think about this question of how much is it psych uh, purely a psychological meaning or to what extent is it a social meaning that is being attempted to be conveyed? <coughs> a little bit of uh, German art history in here. You know, he loved, um, um, you know, Grunewald or Altdorfer, Bosch, Bosch, all these kind of earlier Germanic uh, sources, really are somewhere there, their nightmarish visions of hell and so forth. It's all sort of somewhere here unspecified in the background, I think. It's less obsessively personal maybe than his works of the 1920s. By the end of the 1930s, he's not really uh, linking himself with the surrealist group directly anyway. And I, I don't really have time to, to show, but he, he's also ex exploring uh, surrealism in sculpture. You know, he's one of the important figures for doing that. Okay, let's stop there. That's not a bad point to stop. We'll um, look then next week at some of the other major surrealist artists, starting with Miro, then looking at Magritte and Dali. And Briefly, perhaps, as some, some other surrealists that we'll have time to cover. And then that will be our last week. That will be our 12th, 12th weeks of, of, of class. So 